So this is the last in our sermon series based on liminal Lent, related to the account of Joseph. So we're going to read from Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. So we thank God for the reading of his word. So last week we heard how Joseph settled his fathers and brothers in Goshen in Egypt. In chapter 47, we were told they acquired property there and were fruitful and increased in number. Jacob lived in his new home in Egypt for 17 years until the time came for him to die. Before Jacob breathed his last, he placed an extensive blessing upon Joseph, upon Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and the rest of Jacob's sons, and he spoke prophetic words over all of them. As he blessed his family, Jacob called on the covenant God had made with his ancestors, Abraham and Isaac. This was no minor blessing, since Jacob was calling on a covenant which to, was to result in the blessing of the whole earth. The covenant and blessings given to these ancient patriarchs were part of God's plan for the salvation of the whole world, which is still playing out. At Jacob's request, he was buried back in Canaan, in his father Isaac's cave. Because of Joseph's position, Jacob received the highest level state funeral. He was mourned for just two days less than they would mourn a pharaoh. Joseph travelled with his father's body and his family to Canaan. It marks 39 years since he had first left. After the burial of Jacob, we find in our opening passage that Joseph's brothers, they reasoned that since Jacob was now dead and Joseph was now in the place of power in the family, he might well turn on them for all the evil they had once done to him. The brothers begged for Joseph for forgiveness. Joseph then wept at the realisation his brothers had just not grasped that they had been completely forgiven almost two decades before. This made me wonder how many of us are hanging on to guilt for things that God has forgiven and forgotten many years ago. Joseph reassures his brothers, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph did not minimise or overlook the wrong the brothers had done to him. He states clearly, your intention was to harm me. And some translations say, you meant evil against me. Joseph's approach to his brothers had nothing to do with the permissiveness that indulges the wrongdoer and removes the need for a change of heart and mind. When we minimise or trivialise sin, we take away the need for repentance. And in doing this, we close the door to receiving God's all-encompassing and complete forgiveness and healing. Joseph's faith came down to this. He had come to know and trust God's sovereignty, his goodness and his providence, his supreme and absolute power and will. Joseph knew God would bring good out of the very worst that mankind could devise, 
and that God would accomplish his will no matter what. Despite all the injustice and suffering Joseph had been through, years of imprisonment, betrayal by his brothers, attempted murder, being sold into slavery, and arrows of temptation and accusation, Despite all this, Joseph could see God's hand at work in the outcome of events. He had been vindicated by his promotion to the highest office in the land, and his reputation was impeccable. But more than this, God had used the evil done against him to bring about the saving of many lives. Thousands lived who otherwise would have starved to death, not least Joseph's own family. As we head towards Easter this week to mark the death and resurrection of Jesus, the account of Joseph and his brothers draws many parallels with the account of Judas, another act of evil, harm and betrayal, this time towards Jesus. Another act that God used and is still using for the saving of countless lives. Let's jump over to the New Testament for a while. The start of John, chapter 13, reads, It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Verse 18. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfil this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send, accepts me. And whoever accepts me, accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and asked, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Jesus had taken, sorry, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. As we know, this account leads to the betrayal of Jesus by Judas with a kiss, which identified Jesus to the chief priests. They arrested him, which of course led to his death by crucifixion. Judas was one of the twelve disciples and a close friend of Jesus. He lived and walked with Jesus for approximately three years and would have known him intimately, watching him heal and transform broken lives as God's son. Yet for 30 pieces of silver, he was willing to betray one of his closest friends. Intriguingly, one of Joseph's brothers was called Judah. This was the brother who instigated the plan to sell Joseph for 20 shekels of silver. The name Judah is pronounced Judas in Greek. We probably all wonder what could have caused Judas to sink that low and feel a strong sense of what he did towards Jesus. And also what Joseph's brothers did was wrong and was evil. However, intriguingly, it seems the betrayal of Jesus and Joseph had to happen. Jesus' betrayal led to his crucifixion. And in the book of 1 Peter, Jesus' death on the cross is described as an event that was planned even before the creation of the world. 
Jesus himself said, referring to Judas' actions, this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. And he's referring to Psalm 41, 9, which says, even my closest friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread has turned against me. This raises an interesting paradox. Was Judas free to choose to betray Jesus? Or did God predetermine this as part of his divine plan? Was everything that happened to Joseph also predetermined by God? Which of course raises a question for us too. Do we truly have the freedom to make choices, bad or good? Or is everything in our lives predetermined by God? And it leads us to wonder, maybe none of us are truly responsible for our actions. Punishment for crimes only makes sense if, if humans are free to make choices. If God has predetermined everything, then punishment makes no sense, since we are merely complicit in his divine plan. However, the Bible does seem to show that God gives humanity the freedom to make choices. For example, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had a clear choice to do the right or wrong action, and they chose the wrong, which had implications for all humanity from then on. God clearly held them responsible for their actions, and there were consequences, including banishment from the Garden of Eden. Judas himself clearly felt repentance and regret for betraying Jesus. When he realised his action had condemned Jesus to die, he was seized with remorse, returned the silver to the chief priests and told them he had sinned. Tragically, he then went and hung himself. All this surely knows, shows that he knew he felt responsible for his actions. Likewise, we see the same remorse and regret in Joseph's brothers. They ask for forgiveness, showing a sense of personal responsibility. In his speech at Pentecost in, in Acts chapter 2, Peter brings both sides of this paradox together. He talks to the crowd about Jesus. Fellow Israelites, he says, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you know yourselves. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. Both God's deliberate plan and the actions of wicked men. So we can't let Judas off. Despite God's plan, Judas did not knowingly cooperate with it. He was in total ignorance of God's divine plan and purpose. Judas freely chose to betray Jesus with a kiss, and Joseph's brothers freely chose to do harm or evil to him. God is in control of every aspect of our life, but he chooses not to exert his control in a way that robs us of our freedom. And this is a paradox. We have to hold both sides together, even though we cannot fully understand. Human beings have genuine and accountable freedom but God is working out his perfect plan and purpose. Everything the enemy threw at Joseph and Jesus was used for their good. And this is our blessing too. The same blessing given, given to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob because of their faith. A blessing of redemption. As Romans 8, 28 puts it. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. This is the blessing of redemption. So like Joseph, we can know and trust in God's sovereignty, goodness and providence, his supreme and absolute power and will. A God who brings good out of the worst that mankind can devise and a God who will accomplish his divine purpose and plan in our lives when we follow him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that what the enemy uses for harm in our lives, you use it for good. We thank you that in the ultimate example of this, through the harm done to Jesus, you used it for the saving of millions of lives and still counting. 
Give us the same trust in you, Lord, modelled by Joseph and Jesus. We believe you are sovereign and in control, even when it does not seem that way. As you freely forgive us, help us to freely forgive others, knowing that we must not take your place to exercise judgment. And release us, Lord, from any guilt we are carrying from sins long ago, forgiven and forgotten by you. We thank you for the right standing we have with you, through faith in Christ alone. Let us never trivialise or minimise sin, but rather know that through repentance you offer complete forgiveness and healing. And may the God before whom Abraham, Isaac and Jacob walked so faithfully, the God who was their shepherd all their lives, the God who delivered them from all harm and called them by name, also bless us abundantly with the blessing of redemption. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.